Worshiping the Lord in here will definitely give you the victory tomorrow. I'm telling you right now. Jeez. It's because I don't like to move. I tell you right now, and this is a serious note, when all hell breaks loose in your house, you will move. The Bible says that every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. You just have a choice if you want to do it voluntarily or do you want to do it mandatory. I'd rather do it right now, voluntary, amen? Amen. Well, we welcome you to Lifeline Heart of Worship. If you just walked in, you're like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? It's going on. Anybody here joining us for the first time? We just want to bless you this afternoon or this morning. Oh, there you are. God bless you. God bless you. We welcome you. God bless you. Anybody in the balcony that's brand new? Anybody? All right. All right. Everybody's a regular up there. Okay. Well, we welcome you to Lifeline Heart of Worship. Our vision is simple healing for the body, mind, and soul. And uh, we, we want you to know that if you're looking for the perfect church, we are definitely not it. But God is putting us all together. We're broken pieces, but the Lord is putting us back together again. So if you're looking for that church, then we are it for you. Amen. And we're grateful for what the Lord is doing in our lives. Like I said, we're all broken, but he's putting us back together. Uh, we started a series last week. I don't know if you were blessed by David, undrafted David, how to face your giants, so on and so forth. We'll get into that a little bit more, but I'm going to get right into the word of God. So if you're ready, say, I am ready. You are ready. All right. We had a great service this morning, by the way. If you're watching online, thank you for tuning in. Watch what it says in Ephesians 6.12. Watch what it says and read it carefully. Very common verse, but very powerful verse. Help me preach this morning. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you did this morning at 9, Lord. But we're grateful for what you're about to do right now at 11. So, Holy Spirit, we've, the presence has been set. Father God, we're grateful for Jesus that died on the cross, but we're also grateful that you left one with us, Father, that you even called greater, called the Holy Spirit, one that can permeate in this place and can break the hardest heart and mend the broken heart, the Spirit, Father God, that would guide us, direct us, and protect us, Father God. So we're grateful, Holy Spirit. We thank you for being in this place. Take control of this service. These are your people. This is your church. Do your thing as you see fit. And help me deliver this message exactly as you gave it to me so people may leave today not only with filled with hope father god with faith but most important father god knowing that they that, that you have them in your hands father god if we allow us to give our life up to you father god holy spirit we thank you lord for those that continue to give faithfully to this ministry you know who they are we bless them father god and now holy spirit do you think in jesus name we pray would somebody say amen. amen would you do me a favor and bless two or three people right there where you're at Bless them and say, it's so good to see you. Again, if you're watching us online, we welcome you to Lifeline Heart of Worship. Uh, like I said, if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. But come and visit us. We're a bunch of broken pieces and the Lord is putting us back together again. Do us a favor, drop us a comment, tell us where you're watching from and share it on your uh, uh, social media just so we can get the word of God to as many people as possible. Amen. <clears throat> Are you ready? All right. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, the scripture says against the rulers, against the authorities. This is in your Bible app, this is in your Lifeline app, if you have it or you can watch on the screen. Against the powers of this dark world. I'm, I'm going to tell you something just that, that I left out this morning, but that it, I think is just very important. You can't believe that there's a God and angels and not believe that there's demon and, and there's a devil. You can't believe that there's not spirits. You can't believe that there's not any states. Just believe that there's a God. No, they're, they're, the darkness exists. Evil exists. I don't think I have to convince you that. Last week we talked about part one, undrafted. We talked about David. We talked about how God looks at the heart and not the size. We also told you how it's important that to confront your, 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 your giants, you have to be able to use the weapons that the Lord has given you. And we told you that he goes with you every step of the way, that he's prepared you in the past to defeat the giants that are coming to face you today. And today, like I said, we're going to turn the, the, the page a bit. We're still in the Old Testament uh, but we're going to talk about another great man of God that, again, when you hear the story, you know the result. But the whole process, you know, the whole process that some of us sometimes we like to skip, we want to skip. The whole process is so important. And this gentleman is named Gideon, just an ordinary man. I preached the story from a different perspective, but I was, in, I was really, you know, just amazed. I love reading the word when it comes to, to the stories that you've read because you always find something that you've never seen before. And uh, there's about two or three things that I saw different in this scripture this time that I read it. And I hope you would stay throughout the whole thing, even after the altar call, to hear the final point. Uh, but again, this gentleman, just simple. And, and I told you last week 
that the enemy does such a great job of confusing us and, and, and making us fight the wrong battle. I told you that last week. And this scripture confirms it. Our battle isn't physical. It is spiritual. And why, why am I saying that? It's because sometimes, and I'm saying this a lot, and it probably seems like I repeat this a lot, but it's only because we're dealing with it and we deal with it so much in church. We, we deal with it so much with people that we know. And that is that sometimes we mistake depression and anxiety and, and fear and we, we, we just as emotional issues and mental problems. And while they do affect the mind and they are uh, tied to your emotions and how you feel so on and so forth, I want to just make something clear that there are more than just emotions. They are spirits. Amen. And, and if you don't know that, you won't know how to combat it. You won't know how to fight it. So you think a pill will fix it. And I'm not against medication. I believe medication has its purpose and its plan. I am a nurse. I understand it. But I also believe that sometimes it's just spiritual. It is just spiritual. And we have to be able to discern what those spirits are. Pastor, how, 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 do, how, how do those things happen? Well, somewhere along the way, you and I or we are exposed to things, kind of like sicknesses, kind of like, man, I don't know where I got the flu. I don't know where I got, you, you get it and you don't know who, where you picked it up from. Sometimes at work, you may be in a shopping center, whatever the case, you don't know where you get it. Spirits are the same way. They kind of linger and they are in the realm here in this earth and they just kind of, kind of just trying to figure out who's got a weak immune system. If you know what I mean, if you're weak. And so, and so you are unconsciously sometimes exposed to it. Sometimes in that early, you, you'll welcome them in. And if your spirit is not right, uh, it, it can happen to, to anyone. And, and it's interesting because yeah, people that struggle with this will feel, with, with either, especially depression, especially with anxiety, they feel overwhelmed. They feel overpowered. They feel helpless and hopeless. And sometimes it's just something that, you know, in their mind, you hear this all the time. People will say things like, I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel like I'm going crazy. I can't shake this off. I can't shake this off. I'll never forget years back, I suffered myself from depression. Our church was going through so many things. Our family was going through so many things. I mean, everything that could have possibly hit our life financially, spiritually, mentally, socially, marital, everything. I mean, we were hit. And I struggled with depression. And I couldn't just shake it, you know. And then just a few years back in 2016, I preached to you before that I struggled with anxiety. And this is something that I, again, if you know me, I'm, uh, I'd be the type to say, oh, man, that's, get over it. You know, just, it's in your mind. Just get over it. It is not until I experienced it myself that I realized there was something so heavy, so powerful. And I suffered in it. It's just something, you know, that just, I, I, I remember my, my suffering would be between from 2 and 4 in the morning. And it would always happen at night. And I'll never forget that, that you know, I, I would kind of get up and I would pace. My wife was, you know, I would probably wake her up at times because I was so restless. But I kind of just paced back and forth in the living room just going crazy. And just like, my God, to the point sometimes even of suicide. Like, I just, I got to get rid of this. This is just eating me up. And I believe I'm a strong-minded person. But even that, I could not defeat this. So I began to pray. Watch. I began to pray. And I asked the Lord, Lord, you've got to remove this. You've got to remove this spirit that is driving me insane. It's, I, I, it's just really eating me up. And it's frustrating because then during the day you can't function because you haven't slept during the night. And I remember praying and praying and praying and it just, nothing would happen until I finally realized that, that I was actually praying the wrong way. Please listen. I was asking the Lord to remove the problem rather than to reveal what was causing it. I'm just trying to help you this morning. I'm just trying to help you this morning because see, some of you will continue to pray to remove a certain problem or a certain symptom and you want to remove it and the Lord may remove it or put it out of it. But guess what? Once you come back into it, you'll fall right into it again. But if he can reveal what the cause is, not only will he set you free, but who the sun sets free is free indeed. And so I remember that night so clearly. Three in the morning, I was delivered from this spirit of anxiety. I delivered. The Lord showed me what caused it. I got rid of the, of the issue and got rid of it and so on and so forth. And so I, I want you to understand that these spirits are real. These spirits do attack. Some of you may be dealing with it right now. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You can't function. Certain places, certain things trigger certain things. And so today we're going to get into that. But before I do that, I'm going to change the channel. I don't know about you. I'm going to talk maybe more about to the men than I do the women here. But how many of you like action movies, man? I'm a big action guy. I mean, I love I love action movies, right? I love action movies. Now, every once in a while, my wife's like, hey, let's go watch a girl movie, you know? Like, and it's rare because I just, man, I'm like, I feel like I'm wasting time, right? <laughs> right? But, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I just love action movies. Pastor, who are your favorite actors? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. My top four, I mean, I don't have so many, but my top four actors are Denzel Washington. <laughs> Equalizer, you know? How long it's going to take him to whoop 30 people, you know? 
right? Another one, Gerard Butler. I mean, who doesn't like Gerard Butler? It's amazing how you're clapping for the movies, but when I was reading the Word of God, no one was clapping anything. It's pretty impressive. Okay, Gerard Butler, especially like this one just came out, Angel Has Fallen, right? It's okay, Mr. President, I've got you. You know, it's just, you just got to love the guy, right? Who doesn't like Mark Wahlberg in Mile 22? I mean, Mark Wahlberg is just, I mean, the guy is just shredded, right? I mean, he kind of looks like me without a shirt, but um, he's just awesome. The guy is just, like, awesome. And then, of course, if you don't like Keanu Reeves and John Wick, I don't know where you've been. But, like, I mean, after I saw John Wick, I wanted to buy a suit. You know, just to just, uh, and, and I'm just going to talk to the men here for a minute. I mean, isn't it true, man, as soon as you finish watching a movie, you feel you can take on the whole world. Uh, you feel like you can beat him. You're like, babe, babe, hit me. But, but when you hit me, hit me this way so that I know where it's coming and I know what to do. <laughs> the truth of the matter is when we're watching the movie, we're like, oh, man. He's like, oh, yeah, and he's doing this and this and that. And I would do this and I would do that. But in the real fact, we'd probably get our butts kicked. I mean, truth be told, you know, it, it, this happens. But I'm trying to get to a point. The point that I'm trying to make is that regardless of what people say, Christianity is going to require for you to fight. I'm going to say that again. Christianity is going to require for you to fight. Nehemiah 4.14 tells me very clearly, learn to fight for your family, for your friends, for your marriage, for your kids. You're going to have to learn to fight for what you love. You're going to have to learn to fight for these things. Amen? <clears throat> Truth of the matter is, church, is that it's not an easy fight. It's not an easy fight. In fact, it can be even di more difficult than a vertical physical fight. It can be frustrating and draining and stressful. Why? Because you can be praying for your kids. You can be praying for your marriage. And sometimes you feel like nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. But I want you to understand that God is working behind the scenes if you would remain faithful during that process. Just learn to embrace that process and know that God will continue to do what he needs to do. And when it's all said and done, it will definitely be worth it but today's point is simple because like I said we've got to learn how to fight but we got to learn how to fight God's way not our way that's the question so I'm going to show you that today in the story and so as we get into the the intro I'm going to get to Judges 6 verse 1 this whole story is in Judges 6 the whole verse uh, the whole chapter excuse me chapter 6 and chapter 7 so if you want to go home and do some homework go ahead but I'm just going to kind of brace right through it just so we can be on the same page here but watch what it says as the intro. The Israelites did what? Evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord, what did it say? He handed them over, it says, to the Midianites for seven years. It's interesting because when you read Genesis, it sounds like the same thing. When you read Exodus, it sounds like the same thing. When you read Numbers, it sounds like the same thing. And now we get to Judges, and it seems like the same thing. There's a pattern here. It's like the Israelites are like a broken record. You know, God would deliver them. God would bless them, you know, and all of a sudden it would get to their head. All of a sudden they would sin, forget about God. Then all of a sudden they would fall back into a trap. God would raise somebody else up to deliver them. God would bless them. And then the whole cycle repeats itself again. And this is no different. The only difference now is that the enemies change. Now it was the Midianites. Last week it was the Philistines. The week before that, or when we talk about Moses, there was, you know, the Egyptians and so on and so forth. So there was always someone that, that the Lord allowed to happen because we, we forget. They forgot to, 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 to give God glory, to give, to be grateful for the Lord's victory. And I'm telling you, it almost sounds like us. We keep falling for the same thing and we keep falling, praying for the same thing, the same issue. And God says, I'm trying to deliver you past that. I'm trying to deliver past that. And so here the Bible says that he, he for seven years, he gave them to the Midianites. And what the Israelites would do, if you read in chapter 6, that every time, uh, now they, they were kind of bound to the, to the Midianites. Every time the Israelites would, would uh, what do you call it, would sow and, and they would harvest, these guys would come and steal everything. They would steal everything to the point that the Bible says that some Israelites would hide in caves. They would hide in caves and they would hide their provisions, provisions, what the Lord provided for them. They would hide it in jars. They would hide it in jars, just kind of put it away so that they wouldn't steal it. So at least they would have something to eat. And so we get to the story here today. And this is no different. God raises up another gentleman. We just said his name. His name is Gideon. Ordinary man. God uses them to do something extraordinary. He says, I need you to defeat a great army again you can read this whole story in Judges 6 and 7 now again he's just an average Israelite I want you to understand number two he was a farmer he was a farmer he had no experience in leading an army he had no experience in, he knew about corn he knew about crops he knew about his land that's what he did but God is calling him for this specific time and this specific purpose so when God when, when Gideon hears the call he kind of listens and he says oh my God 
is that God really calling me? I mean, I'm a farmer. How am I going to lead an army? I don't have no experience. I mean, I, no, that, I, I, it's definitely not me. So what does he do? He asks for three signs. Y'all better get this. He asks for three signs. And the first sign, the Bible says that the Lord says, place, place an offering there. It was an offering of meat, the Bible says, with unleavened bread. You can read this in 6. And it says, place it there, and you'll see that I will consume it with fire to show you that what I'm telling you is true. Boom, sure enough, the fire consumes the offering. But then all of a sudden, Gideon comes down and he's like, oh, okay, I, I saw that once. He goes, but, but he, you can read it in 37. He says, but show me just one more sign. Show me just one more sign. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to put this uh, a piece of what he called it, of wet fleece on the ground. Or I want you to turn this dry fleece. I want you to turn it wet, but the ground around it, I want the ground to be dry. Sounds like a crazy test. But guess what? The next morning comes and that's exactly what happens. The ground was dry. The Bible says that he picked up the fleece and he could literally spill a whole glass full of water. And then it goes on to say, it's really interesting because it says, God, don't be mad at me. I love it. He says, God, don't be mad at me. But let me ask for one more request. Let me flip it around. Now make the ground wet and make the dry, uh, fleece dry. And what does God do? Boom, he shows up. One, two, and three. I, I, I want to just clarify something with you because every time you make some great decision, this is how I handle business. This is how I handle the church. This is how I handle life. Is I ask the Lord for signs and when I fast. And one of the things that you guys got to understand that when you ask the Lord for signs, you are not testing God. You are getting clarification and confirmation from him. Some people will say, no, if God said it, you should do it. And that's why there are a lot of people that are hurt in ministry. And that's why a lot of people leave the church because they just base it on the emotion. They say, well, I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to check, I didn't want to check it. No, it is actually wise to actually put God and say, I'm not putting you to the test. If this is really you, you will confirm it. And guess what? God understands wisdom and he understands that there's false prophets. He says, I'll show you that I'm talking to you. So God revealed to him loud and clear. He says, all I need you to do now is just defeat the mighty Midianites. Now here's the thing. He's going to choose this farmer to lead a nation into battle. And this is what I love about this story is that God can use whoever he wants. God could use whoever he wants. And I'm, I'm encouraging you today, if you're young, if you're older, whatever, can you say, man, can God really use me? God can use anyone. If you are willing and able, God, I'm telling you right now, some of you have talked yourself out of God's purpose simply because you feel unqualified. You feel like you don't have the right title. You don't have the right preparation. I didn't go to Bible school. I didn't do this. I, whatever the calling may be, and you've tried to talk yourself out of it. But I've got news for you. Jesus picked 12 disciples, and none of them had a great resume. None of them had a great resume. All of them were chumps. None of us would pick those 12. But Jesus picked them for one simple reason, not because they were qualified, because they were willing. They were really simply fishermen, simply tax collectors, people that were just, just crazy. I'm telling you right now, I'd have been crazy to put me to run a church. It's amazing. I, I don't have a master's in theology. I don't have a doctorate in any of that. I was just simply obedient to what the Lord said, and the Lord has done great things. Amen? So God calls Gideon, right? And he says, this is what you're going to do. And, and in a normal reaction, it's just normal for Gideon to question. He's already gotten the signs. He's got, but I'm sure he's got some doubt. I'm sure he's got some fear. I'm sure he's got some anxiety. And he asked a sincere question. How am I going to lead this army? How? The simple answer, you're not. God is through you. And that's the one thing, church, I want you to just kind of take with today, this, this morning. Because some of you have been asking yourself, how am I supposed to lead a family? How am I supposed to be a parent when I didn't even have parents? How am I supposed to show love when I didn't even uh, know what a hug was from a parent? I don't know what it is for my father to come to a game. I don't know what it is for my mother to come and come to a reward ceremony. I don't know what it is to get a pat on the back and say, you're doing a great job. So I don't know what that is, Pastor. How am I supposed to lead my family? Some of you, how am I supposed to lead? my marriage when I come from from divorce and after divorce and after divorce and my parents divorce and their parents divorce and there's just curse of divorce in my life and some of you even young adults say pastor how am I supposed to go to college when none of my uh, what do you call my family members have gone to college I don't have the means I don't have what it needs but I've got news for you if you're willing he is able because it is not you that is going to do it it is God in you and through you amen all you have to do is be willing. And the same God that is with Gideon is the same God as with you. Amen? So you have this farmer finally convinced that he has to go. So he gets all his people, get it, get situated, and they get ready. And he gets 32,000 men. I preach the story from a different perspective, but just kind of stay with me. 32,000 men. And here's the thing. 
Sounds like a lot of people. 32,000 men, I mean, it is quite a bit of people. But it's not until you see your opponent that you begin to see exactly what you look like. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. Uh, the Bible describes it, the Bible says that Gideon described it, that their army was like a swarm of locusts, like camels, like sands, like sands of the seashore. The Bible says, and historians believe, that their army, when he got to see who he was going up against, their size was 120 to 135,000 people. So 32,000 all of a sudden doesn't seem like much. It doesn't seem like much. 32,000 definitely does not seem like much. And just when you think you get it, it's probably like, okay, well, I got the three signs I needed. He gave me this 32,000 men. God's be, he has to be up to something. God pulls Gideon aside and says, you have too many men. He says, you have too many men. I can just, I can just picture, he's like, okay, God, maybe you're not counting right. But the last time I checked, we're 32,000. There are 132,000. We're just a shy 100K. Just for your FYI, because that's what we try to do. We try to reason with God like he doesn't know. Right? Just so you know, God. And here's the thing. Our logic and our mentality will always tell us that bigger is better and that more is better, so on and so forth. But that is not the God that I serve. God is not a logical God. God is not a God necessarily that deals with numbers. He's the one that can put a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread and feed 5,000. To him, two plus two isn't necessarily four. And it's interesting because... We believe that more is better. So what do we do when we're in a personal crisis, in a personal situation? We try to tag as many people on Facebook, get as many people on Twitter, on the social media. Everybody, everybody's got to know your problem. Everybody's got to know your situation because the more people that know, the better. Nonsense. Nonsense. You've got to be careful who you are sharing it with because you're trying to tag along. I, I just need you to help me pray. Hey, would you help me pray? Hey, would you help me pray? Hey, would you pray? People that don't even pray for themselves. And you're trying to get people to pray for you. I've got news for you. God does not need numbers to win. I'm going to say that again. God does not need numbers to win. In fact, when you read scripture, it's actually the opposite. We see a pattern from the Old Testament to the New Testament where God will use the little to bring great response. He'll use a group of small things to destroy many. He'll use small little things to frustrate many. We've seen this over and over. I told you last week there was one guy named David who, because of him, where they were able to destroy a whole army. We just said it earlier that Jesus changed the world with 12 individuals. We don't need hundreds and thousands of people. And here, God pulls him aside and he says, Gideon, I love you. I need you to get rid of some people. He's like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but like one or two? He's like, no, I need you to get rid of all of those that are afraid. Watch. I need you to get rid of all of those that, that, that have the spirit of fear. Why? Why, church? Why fear? You're going into battle, and fear is contagious. Fear is contagious so much. Some of you have been hanging around the wrong group of people. I'm telling you right now, you're hanging around the wrong group of people that, that even when you are sick, and you come up to them, they're like, man, I don't know, man. I just, I just don't feel right. They're like, yep, it's probably cancer. You're probably going to die. So I'm, I'm, and you think I'm joking, but I've heard negativity. That people will try to, I mean, they'll literally bury you before you die. And just in their, and guess what happens? Some of you are, may not even be afraid, but you start hanging around people that are afraid, you'll start being afraid. Because fear is, a, is a, it's contagious. Fear is a spirit. And so God says, you need to get rid of everyone that is fearful. Church, what's the point if you have 20 people that are with you and you're going into battle and 19 of them are afraid? What's the point? All they're going to do is hinder you. All they're going to do is scare you. All they're going to do is bring you down. You would have already lost the fight before you even got to the fight. God says, so I've got to remove certain people in your life that are, that are, that are, not, that are not with you. I've got to remove certain people in you that are afraid. I've got to remove them that all they do is just talk fear in your life. I've got to remove those people in your life. And if we don't understand that, we will mistake pain for purpose when God is saying, I know this is going to hurt, but I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to prune you. Those people around you don't really help you. Those people around you are actually weighing you down. Those people around you will actually hold you back. And he's up to 32,000 men. 10,000 is what he was left with. The Bible says that 22,000 were afraid. 22,000 were afraid. They were afraid and they left. Church, I'm telling you right now, Gideon is probably thinking to himself, all right, well, I got 10,000. I mean, 
I went from 32 to 10. I, I don't know what God is doing, but let's keep pressing forward. God pulls Gideon aside again. He says, hey man, can we talk? And I'm sure Gideon probably thought, oh great, he's sending two armies to help me. Because that's what we think. Oh, he's probably going to send some reinforcements. He says, you still have too many men. I can picture Gideon saying, Lord, I, uh, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Because that's what we'll do when we go through a circumstance. We start rebuking the devil when it's God all along trying to do something great. And if we don't have that spirit of discernment, we will mistake in the two. And he says, God, are you serious? I just, I just lost 22,000 men. Are you serious, Lord? God says, I, I know, I got this. Get rid of them. What, what do you want me to do? He's like, they're thirsty. Have them drink water. You remember the story. I've done the illustration. But for those of you that have not seen the story, this is such a powerful time in this, in, this, in this part of the story. Why? Because he says, I want you to observe how they drink. And so you had uh, 10,000 men drinking uh, water. Sorry, but, but a few or some were drinking from like dogs and they were on all fours and they were drinking like dogs. And the others were drinking, lapping it from their with their hands, bringing it and cupping it to their mouth. And the Lord says, get rid of those that drink like dogs. Pastor, what? What are you talking about? Get rid of those that drink like dogs. You know the story. That the whole purpose and the whole vision and the whole uh, revelation behind it. He says, those people are so focused on the need that they'll lose focus on the vision. Get the ones that even when they drink, they're still looking not to watch you. They're still looking not to make sure no one is coming. Get rid of those. You don't need them. The problem was that 9,700 drank like dogs. So he's counting and he's like, only 300 drank this way. 9,700 left, leaving, leaving him with only 300 men. I can picture at this point, Gideon is like, we're all dead. Shoot. I want to believe somewhere deep inside he had a Daniel spirit. He had a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego spirit that he said, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, with this 300 and if we die, I would rather die for my Lord than live in failure and live in sin and live in that. So he says, rise up, Gideon. With those 300 men, I'm going to give you the victory that you want. I'm here to tell you today that God's about to remove certain people that don't see like you, certain people that are distracting you, certain people that are bringing you down. And if your number of friends is going down, it's only because God's about to do something great. I'm trying to preach to somebody right now that the Lord is pruning and it may hurt, but God says, I'm going to do something great in your life. I wonder if there's anybody that can shoot your hands up and say, Lord, prune my life. Prune my life in Jesus' name. can stay worshiping but man if you missed this last part this is it right here this is where I saw it and I got saved in my office this past week never seen this in the story but before we do that I got to say a prayer of salvation so if you don't have Jesus as your personal Savior he's not leading your battle he's not your director he's not your leader he's not your captain make him your captain today if you're watching online just repeat after us Lord Jesus I am a sinner but you are my savior. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding me, replacing my past and giving me a future. I choose you today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you believe it and you said that prayer, we celebrate with you. Come on, let's celebrate with them. Amen. Watch, it's about to go off in just a minute. I hope you can get this revelation like the Lord gave it to me. And hopefully when you get it, you'll run to the altar and say, Lord, prune me. Lord, I am here. Lord, bless me. Watch. I'm going to read nine. But when you see nine, to understand nine, you've got to understand eight. Eight is not up there, so I'll just paraphrase it for you. He says, before you go, 
God tells Gideon, all right, now that you got rid of these 9,700 that were drinking like dogs, don't just leave them there. He says, go back to where they're at, get their weapons and get their provisions. I never got that. I never got that. He says, their pots and everything, he goes, bring them. They don't need them. And I find it interesting that when you're getting ready to do God's will and God's purpose, whoever's not with you shouldn't be taking what's supposed to be for you. So be very careful that don't be apologetic for those people that you're trying to hand out and give certain things that are not with you. Be careful. Number one. Number two. Watch what happens in verse nine. This is powerful. Watch, watch, watch. <clears throat> that night, the Lord said, get up. Go down into the Midianite camp. He's speaking to Gideon. For I have given you victory over them. Watch. Reassurance. Prophesy. Victory is yours. But watch what verse 10 says. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura, it says, and listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. Wait, 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 wait. But if you're afraid, didn't we get rid of those already in the first bunch? <clears throat> we see Gideon's spirit of fear return. God would not have said something if he doesn't already know. So he says, get in, get in. I, I got you. Slow your roll. I got you, Gideon. He says, I remember the first time you doubted me, you asked for three signs. So I'm already a step ahead of you. All you got to do is go to the edge, check them out, and you'll be encouraged. Powerful. If you are afraid, of course he is afraid. Watch what it happens in verse 13. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. He's coming up, he's got a companion, and he's telling them a what? Watch, he's telling them a dream. The man said, I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. His companion answered, watch, it's why you need people that are fearless, and it's why you need people that have the same vision. Watch. He said, your dream can only mean one thing, Gideon, is that God is giving you the victory over all, over Midian and all its allies. When Gideon heard this, he fell to the ground and began to worship. Watch, watch. He'd forgotten the dream. He'd forgotten the dream, but God says, if you go, something's going to happen. So in obedience, he moves, and as he's going, he's sharing this, and this. wait, I had a dream. And the Lord says, I'm confirming to you just to let you know, because you're a guy that needs signs, just to tell you that I am with you. You've got nothing to fear. Watch. Now comes the best part. So he gets, get your, get your pots, get your lights, get your torches, no guns, because they're weapons were torches and pots for the provision. Stay with me. Watch. Last one, 17 and 18. Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. There was no doubt about that because he had already got rid of the dogs. Watch. When I come to the edge of camp, just do as I do. And as soon as you see me blow the ram's horn, blow your horns too and all around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Notice, watch. Verse 20. Then all the groups, watch what it says, all three groups blew their horns and... Wait, 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 wait. We just took the jars from somebody else because they're carrying somebody's provision. Now my own provision, the Lord's wanting me to break. God's saying, don't you understand that in those provisions you were hiding from your enemy you were hiding but you no longer have to hide your blessings so hide your sack lunch throw away your lunch box i'm about to take you into the promised land and i'm here to tell you today some of you are still trying to bring old stuff into a new place but god says i cannot pour new wine in old wineskins get rid of the old break it and give me praise he said and there is victory in your praise i wonder if there's anybody here today that would shoot their hands up that I would run to the altar and say, Lord, I'm here. I'm praising you in my storm. I'm praising you in my victory. I'm praising you, believing, Lord, that without you, 